Hello, AHSC. Um, it's such a, an amazing pleasure to be co-presenting with Dasha, who is a friend and a long-standing colleague and someone who really shares my passion for uh, the concept of the next generation becoming happy, healthy, and, and basically looking after us all in, in our old age. Um, so uh, I just want to uh, briefly mention that uh, I am a general practitioner of the past 25 years locally. And um, yeah, so uh, one of my roles that I take in addition to um, the ARC that we've mentioned uh, locally is as president of child and adolescent health uh, in the European Public Health Association. And that's much more a, a sort of community facing um, implementation vehicle for getting the best evidence, but also being advocates. So um, I'm, I'm going to pick up on some of the things that Dasha has been focusing on um, and set us up nicely to think about mental health. And although as a general practitioner, I don't really believe that we should be separating out the physical from the mental, I am going to focus a little bit more on some of the aspects of um, physical health that underpin mental health. I'd like you to, Dasha talked about that concept of, of children saying that they want to feel loved, safe, uh, be able to express themselves and, and, and all of those things that make absolute sense to us. But I'd like you to connect, to have a go at uh, thinking about your own experience of early childhood. Perhaps allow uh, an image of your own childhood to come forward, um, whether that's a happy memory. What are you doing in that image? Are you maybe outside running around? Who's around you and how do you feel? Now, I've, I've done this exercise a few times with people and usually uh, what people will say is that they, they will remember being outside with their friends, all of the things that Dash has uh, set us up for so nicely. And then I get people to think about their, their self now and, and make that connection. How do you really view children? You, we've all had a childhood to be surviving and dialing into this uh, seminar today. That child became the future you. And, and so that's clearly a very important um, determinant of your later life and health. And that's probably my message number one. So this is a picture of me taken well over 50 years ago as a child of three. Uh, and at that time in India, where I was living, um, one in four children did not survive past their fifth birthday. Uh, I think in that picture, I must have known that I was going to England because I'm all trussed up. Um, but the very fact that my mother brought me to the UK just a few months later meant that my life expectancy had more than doubled. I had access to... Uh, healthcare free at the point of delivery, a free education, um, which is perhaps something that my children themselves won't have experienced, um, but so many more things. So uh, I think it's really hard to imagine other people's reality. And I think it does, you know, I'm really fascinated by what Dash is saying about this idea of being able to try and step inside someone else's skin and, and really understand their reality. Um, this is a, a, an untold story, though, because today children are actually healthier than at any other time in history. On the left, you can see how things have changed in under five mortality. So in orange, the number of children who used to die in the 1800s was, in, you know, 40 percent of children. And these gains over a really long period of time got to the point where um, we'd work with Global Burden of Coll Disease Collaborators and reported that there was a historically lowest recorded under five mortality. And we continue to see these gains. So uh, we've achieved those gains through better control measures in public health, largely. Um, control of infectious illness, better hygiene, vaccines, injury prevention, and better health system. So universal coverage of healthcare. And of course, there've been wider improvements in education and fertility control, better care for mothers, um, employment, driving up living standards. So 
that's great. But there's still a substantial difference. If you look at the figure on the right, there's a big difference between the UK, where four per thousand children under the age of five will die, um, and low and middle income countries. So, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, you're still seeing 74 per thousand deaths. Seven percent of children won't make it past their fifth birthday. So message number two is that there are these big global disparities in child health that we should be aware of. So what are the next challenges beyond control of communicable disease? The grand challenges today that I just want to flag to you are that there's been this global rise in non-communicable disease. That big blue rectangle in the middle of all of the things that burden us includes mental health burden, but it also includes things like uh, diabetes, obesity, cancer, um, and, and these things are becoming more of a burden. So on the left, you see that they are underpinned by five or six um, health behaviours. How much we move, what we eat, expose our bodies to. It's Stoptober, so stop smoking months. But remember that young people and children don't always have a choice over what they're able to be exposed to and they're also really influenced by our health behaviors and their peers so that's i suppose message number three which is that you can control your health behaviors but children often can't they don't have the autonomy so they're very dependent on you and they're also influenced by you um dash has uh talked about the impact of the pandemic on uh, mental health, but also we're seeing that um, th there's been a disproportionate impact. So that's why I think of this as a syndemic. We've always had health inequalities, but actually other aspects, physical inactivity fell to its lowest ever recorded level. We've seen the first jump up in obesity rates that we've seen uh, in very young children, uh, uh, as young as the age of six um, in our measurement programme. And uh, again, you know, these children were often unheard and invisible. And, uh, they do need us to be advocates, exactly as Dasha says. Um, we also need to empower and equip them and also need to think a lot about health inequalities, I think. And then the next major challenge, and for this, I think I'm just going to let David Anyone tell his story. Is fighting for breath. It's terrifying because it, it's out of our control. One baby is born every two minutes into toxic care in the UK, due to 29% of hospitals being located in polluted areas. And London has the highest rates of pollution in the country. Esme, my beautiful little girl, she started um, having breathing difficulties at around three to four months old. We were surprised at how um, badly her breathing was affected. At around five months old, she had her first kind of major attack. <laughs> Kind of just yeah, really scary because it was almost like when you listen to the breathing, just hoping the next one comes, hoping the next one comes. Right, you definitely don't want to see me on my bicycle. What we're seeing there is is the third big challenge as I see it. Um, some colleagues from the School of Public Health um, in a study recently published uh, showing that London, among the most polluted cities on the planet. Um, that 3% of preterm births in London are attributable just to traffic exhaust. And you can see the pollutants there, nitrous oxide. These are tiny particles that you can barely see. Um, they're smaller than a, a 50th of a hair's breadth. Um, and they studied residential exposure during pregnancy. That's equivalent to another 3,300 extra uh, preterm births per year and being born too soon means that your lungs are premature and more susceptible to lung problems like bronchiolitis in infants and so in some work that we've done before um, the pandemic we found that um, bronchiolitis increases your respiratory hospitalization rate by three to five fold in under fives and that's for things like pneumonia asthma um, but also wheezing in very young children. And children's asthma admissions are, are very largely attributable to traffic pollution. So this is a 
Health Technology Assessment Re Report by the Environmental Research Group at um, the School of Public Health, showing that one in four of all admissions in children are for asthma, but that exacerbation of asthma by air pollution leads to much more harm in young children. And the point here is that asthma admissions do have more than one cause. Um, so infection and allergy, all of these things work together. In fact, some of the work that we've done, um, and this is a, a millennial cohort, children born at the millennium in the year 2000, um, like my daughter, um, we found that poverty and disadvantage have a tendency to cluster across the whole of their life course and their childhood. So multiple factors in the home, being born too early, preterm, passive exposure to tobacco smoke, multiple infections, poor overcrowded housing and traffic ridden neighborhoods. All of these exposures before the age of three account for about 70% of the difference between children living in disadvantage and those living in the more advantaged homes. Um, so you can see that persistent asthma um, as you're entering your adult years leaps up from 13% to 20%. Right, what can we do about these grand challenges? So the first thing is, even though <laughs> we feel that it's very difficult to access our GPs and GPs are leaving the profession and it's all very difficult times at the moment, I have to say, we have had universal health coverage for over 70 years. And even now in, in this climate of sustainable development, it remains SDG3, a big global goal for everyone to be able to receive the healthcare free at the point of access. And I think that's a wonderful thing. So across the top of this slide, you can see the elements of strong primary care. Every child can access, every family can access healthcare. Strong prevention, first contact care. That means that uh, you, you have a one-stop shop, that's where you go to see GPs, to engage with GPs rather than ending up in the emergency department. Comprehensive care, so we don't turn people away, um, it's, it's any problem. And coordinated care, Dasha was mentioning about the integration that's so important that you send people into hospital and then on to tertiary services, but someone needs to coordinate that and that's a, a huge, huge task. So uh, along the bottom, you see some examples. We see children and families even before children are born across their pregnancy as they become ill. They don't plan to become ill and we get in that prevention uh, as much as we can. And then as children develop um, long term conditions, some of them might need a little bit more input. So just a couple of examples of, of success stories, I think, so we all need a bit of cheering up. Um, so uh, across the bottom here, you see uh, across the 90s up to uh, 2006, we had a slow rise, uh, about 30% increase in pneumonia admissions in children, about 2% being admitted to hospital every year. When we brought in pneumococcal vaccination, to the infant immunization schedule. Within two years, we saw a dramatic drop of about 20%. Um, and in fact, my daughter who was hospitalized in uh, the year 2000 is one of those points on this, um, on this graph. And when you vaccinate the infant population from a very young age, get in early, you see benefits for older ages. And, and I think everyone really understands this concept now that we've been looking endlessly at COVID vaccination graphs, but just vaccinating, vaccinating a, a small minority of the population has benefits. And we've gone on to show uh, that when we widened this to older age groups that we've actually really done well on serious bacterial illness in the UK. And not only serious bacterial illness, but GP visits for middle ear infections, one of the commonest reasons they came, they come to see a GP halved, particularly in winter months. Um, so there are benefits for the health system itself. In fact, um, in some work that we did uh, using GP electronic records over the whole life course from about 13,000 children born uh, again at the millennium, infant vaccination and development checks safeguard against hospital admission across the whole of childhood. 
and those children who miss their vaccinations are much more likely to be admitted to hospital. Um, older children with asthma, diabetes and epilepsy confers a much stronger protection of up to nearly tenfold. So it keeps children out of hospital. But we don't do the best here. So if you compare with other countries in Europe, you see you need a very high uptake rate. And any vaccination programme is very dependent on that uptake rate being maintained. And we only really started to get up to the sort of levels that we need about 10 years ago. And it fluctuates very much, particularly for some individual vaccinations like MMR, for example. Um, so this is um, just making a little point about the accessibility. It's not enough to provide universal access. You have to make sure that people can get access in a timely way. So along the bottom here, this is patients reporting to us how easy it was to, to get a GP appointment on their last attempt. And on the left, about 70% of patients were reporting that they could. And so if you compare those practices on the right, where nearly 100% of their um, patients were able to get a GP appointment, it keeps, seems to keep children out of hospital. So here you see a, about a 10% difference that's equivalent to 30,000 excess visits to emergency departments. And, and that not only saves money, it also frees up resource for the children that really need it. Um, so we also studied the timing of the visits. This was around the time that I think Jeremy Hunt was very keen that doctors should be constantly working in um, hospitals at weekends and into our GP surgeries. We were able to demonstrate actually the peak times for children going to the emergency department was actually, well, between four and six, um, the after school slots. So, uh, and parents told us that they needed those slots um, and that they were often booked up. So uh, we have uh, had a number of schemes where we've opened up um, slots that are dedicated for children's consulting uh, and in other ways, just same day slots because children's consulting is somehow different to uh, much of that in adults. Okay, um, the pandemic, just a brief look at this. One of the things that we've done in general practice is as many of us, uh, when we're told to stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives, do as we're told. But of course, our phone lines went ballistic. So you can see in the run up to the pandemic, this is just a recently published paper, that uh, you see this high seasonality in total contacts. But there you've got the first UK pandemic lockdown uh, at the beginning of 2020 and a dramatic drop in face to face consulting. But by switching to remote contacts, GPs were able to mitigate the falls in face to face contact with GPs. And particularly in that paper, if you'd like to read it, we don't have time now. Um, upheld consulting for children with long term chronic conditions, diabetes, asthma, epilepsy. Um, so it's been hard work, I have to say. Um, some lessons from the recent pandemic hasn't all been bad news. Lockdowns are actually very effective in reducing air pollution, fewer trains, planes, automobiles, an unparalleled natural experiment with lots of valuable lessons. Um, and the UK was estimated to have actually um, reduced a, a very large number of deaths due to air pollution. And I think that uh, that has sharpened minds on uh, the possibility for change and improving the environment. Um, but there's lots more work to be done. So health services can't fix all of the problems in society. And Dash has already said that schools play a huge part, um, but not only in improving mental health, but also, uh, you know, we know that physical activity fell to the lowest ever rates. So this is um, showing a big school project that we have across London called the Improve Study. Um, it's a cohort study where we get junior scientists to wear wrist worn monitors for a week. We monitor their physical health, their activity, their sleep, but also um, we're going to look at their social and emotional development, hopefully across primary school. Um, so uh, schools are really important in creating a healthy and active environment. They need safe roads. They need actually to promote uh, active travel into school. And there are lots of active mile interventions. They need to think a lot more about class breaks. And we hope that we can demonstrate that that actually has an 
uh, an impact on their mental health, their pro-social behaviour, but also their um, uh, ability to learn and concentrate. Measuring what matters is quite important in this uh in this study so we've just published a core outcome set for physical activity interventions in primary schools that we hope will be adopted for other studies in schools um, it was very rigorously done through a series of systematic literature reviews prioritization through delphi surveys lots and lots of people um, but we also did include children um, and this is what they said. And actually, the children themselves um, pointed to a lot to that bit in the middle around social and emotional health. It's really interesting and important. Um, the researchers all wanted to study physical activity rates objectively and their fitness and energy levels. But and the teachers wanted to study educational performance. Um, so the, the different groups have actually um, produced this core set. And I just want to show you. Uh, the impact of citizen science. So um, children have said that they really love taking part in it. Here are some of them. And uh, also parent, a nice quote from one of my um, parents who said that as the school year winds to a close, treasured possessions take their rightful spot. A picture from her sports day and her certificate for her participation in the improved study. Um, so that's really nice. Um, so I think that one of the things that Dash said, you know, is this uh, being seen and heard, respecting children's autonomy. When they do speak up, though, they've actually been very powerful. And, you know, we know about Greta Thunberg. There have been protests in other countries so that, you know, to level gender equalities and give girls access to the same rights. And of course, uh, young people very active in the Black Lives Matter movement, even in lockdown. So here's just bring it all together. Um, are my sort of top foundational actions I think we should invest in the early years. Of course, I would say that. We really need some strong actions to level health inequalities, uh, strengthen the health and educational system, and, and at the top, promote positive health behaviours. But all of this has to be underpinned by strong action on those structural determinants of health to reduce poverty and inequality widely and improve the built and, and national uh, natural environment. So uh, I'll just stop there. I want to thank our funders and thank you for listening.